Welcome back. So this is week eight, and we are in chapter three here of this part of the book, part two. We looked previously at refuge, taking refuge, and then the bodhicitta, uh, looking at different aspects of that. And so today we're looking at the third of the uncommon nundro, if you will, practices, and this one is on Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva is sometimes known as the Buddha purification. And so when we do the Vajrasattva practice, what we're doing is purifying ourselves to prepare us for continuing on with the practice. And so at the beginning here, his first verse, as Patrol Rinpoche's first verse here is, beyond being defiled by the two obscurations, which would be afflictive emotions and mental obscurations, you purport to still by purifying them. So we still them by purifying them. Having certainty, certainly reached the sublime path very end, you profess to still be learning. Beyond extremes of samsara and nirvana, you manifest still in samsara. Peerless teacher, at your feet I bow. So he gives us the instruction then to listen to this chapter the same with the same attitude as before. So paying very close attention to what is being said, to making sure that we understand it, and so forth. So we begin here, part one is how obscure obscurations can be purified through confession. So this begins then talking about various obstacles that we may encounter, various negative actions, obscurations, habitual tendencies, and so forth. And so what we need to do is address those, to deal with those in ways that they no longer affect us in the, our ability to do the practice, to be prepared, like preparing ourselves as a suitable vessel for the rest of what comes after that. And so we want to purify all three of those. So one of the things that we are doing in terms of what we purify then is various negative actions that we have, the karma that we have accumulated uh, throughout beginningless time. And most specifically, we talk about the 10 wholesome and unwholesome actions. So we're purifying those, the karma from the unwholesome actions. And at the same time, we're also taking the step into following those wholesome actions as a part of that. So do good or at least do no harm. Uh, for the benefit of all sentient beings. And then the second one is that it's also important to eliminate our obscurations. And so he, he mentions there, there's a footnote at the bottom of 264, uh, who talks about the alaya, the alaya consciousness, the underlying consciousness in which karmic impressions are stored. And so that's a term that is helpful to know, and be familiar with as a part of that. It's said to be, karma is said to be like a seed. And so into the, our alaya consciousness, we store those seeds. And every time we repeat some kind of a negative action or positive action, that creates that seed. And so we get more and more, the seeds get stronger and stronger as a result of our actions. And so the effects that they have on us in this life or future lives get stronger and stronger as well as a part of that. So then he continues, the conqueror taught countless methods of purification for this purpose, but the best is Vajrasattva. So there are a variety of different methodologies that can be used to purify. Uh, one of the other real strong ones is just Oma Hong, reciting the mantra, Oma Hong, Oma Hong, Oma Hong, representing the Buddha's body, speech, and mind. And so that's another one that is very common. And most of the deity yoga practices include an aspect of purification as a part of them as well. So there are a variety of those, but Vajrasattva is the first one that we typically learn and one that uh, is considered to be very, very powerful means of addressing those things. He says, there is no harmful act that cannot be purified. And I find it interesting a lot of times because when you read discussions about karma, 
they almost always talk about burning the karma up. In other words, having an action, good or bad, that was a result of previous karma that we have. And they almost never mention purification. Well, if we had to correct everything that we have done since beginning of this time, we would never finish that process. We would be literally stuck in uh, samsara, and we would never be able to get out. But through this purification process, we can address these things that have come up in our lives and the karma that's there. We can get rid of those things. But getting rid of the karma is not enough. Uh, we have various obscurations in our mind that get in the way of also achieving enlightenment. And so we have to get rid of those. And then we also need to get rid of any other things that uh, are in our way, like habitual tendencies. So maybe we've had these obscurations and we purify those obscurations, but because of habitual tendencies toward those, all of a sudden, there they are, back again. And so all three of those elements have to be effectively addressed in order for us to achieve enlightenment. So below the quote there at the top of the page, of all negative actions, there is not one, however serious, that cannot be purified by confession. And so here he's introducing the idea of the four powers uh, that take place. We go through this process of confessing the things that we have done, the wrongs that we have done, and then we go through a process of antidotes. And some of the Vajrasattva uh, practices in terms of the sadhanas that we use for that purpose may include these four powers and references to those four powers, but not all of them do. So sometimes we need to just be aware of what those things are and make them a part of the practice ourselves. So on page 265, he goes into part two of the text here, are the four powers. And the first one of those is the power of support. Now the, the titles that are given to these in terms of the translations vary a little bit. And so I'll give you some alternative names for some of these just so that you've got uh, ideas about how otherwise they might be referred to in, in different texts. So here the power of support, for example, is sometimes called the power of reliance and relying on the basically the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha for support. So both of those terms actually are helpful. And so here we take refuge in the in Vajrasattva as a part of this practice. So he becomes the support, and we rely on him as the support to help cultivate our intention and aspect, or excuse me, application aspect of bodhicitta. And so we're trying to correct any of those negative things that we've developed and the habitual tendencies related to that. But then we're also trying to maintain the positive and strong aspects of bodhicitta. And so uh, both of those are an element of what we are doing here. At the bottom of that first paragraph, he says, anyone or anything in whose presence you confess. So. You know, we could do it with any deity, any Buddha, uh, as a part of that. But here it's specifically about Vajrasattva. So that's the context. So then in the second paragraph, before any confession, arousing the bodhicitta of intention and application is indispensable. The Buddha taught that confessing your evil deeds and downfalls without arousing bodhicitta, even though you might apply the four powers, will reduce your faults, but not purify them altogether. So sincerely giving rise to bodhicitta will of itself purify all past misdeeds, whatever they might be. And then he quotes from Shantideva in the Way of the Bodhisattva, uh, as though they pass through the perils guarded by a hero, even those weighed down with dreadful wickedness will instantly be freed through having bodhicitta, who then would not place his trust in it. Just as by the fires at the end of time, great sins are utterly consumed by bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is 
the positive side of thing. The negative side of thing that we're trying to get rid of are all of those other aspects, and that's the reason that we actually apply uh, Vajrasattva, but Vajrasattva includes that bodhicitta element. So there's that positive aspect as well in terms of the power of his support for our practice. So then the second power is that of regretting what we have done, or the power of regret, or some say the, the regret of past deeds. So all of the things that we have done. So this is often articulated in a text as a contemplation. We're contemplating all the negative things that we have done and feeling genuine regret for having done those things. So here the power of regretting having done wrong from a feeling of remorse and the negative actions that you have done in the past, there can be no purification if you do not see your misdeeds as something wrong and confess them with fierce regret. So the practice is first of all kind of reflecting on what those negative things have been. Ostensibly, if you think about it in context of beginning of time, that's an unlimited supply of negative things. So virtually anything bad, you've probably done it at one point or another as a part of that. And so then we recall those things that uh, we have done in the past, the, the things that we can recall. You don't have to recall everything that you've ever done in the past, but think about the things that you can recall and then genuinely regret having done those things as a part of it. So that's the second one, the regret about those past negative actions, the harm that we have caused others, the difficulties we've caused others, and so forth. The third power then is resolution, or some sources say resolve. The idea is again, I resolve not to do these negative actions again. And so making a commitment to that. So here he says to remember the faults we've committed and then resolve never to commit them again from this very day on, even at the cost of your dear life. And he quotes from the prayer of Sukhavati, uh, without a vow for the future from now on, there is no purification. So that's an important point. If we don't make a commitment not to do those things again, you're not really purifying anything. You're just reading a text, reciting a text. So it's very important to commit not to violate those things again. If you don't consider them to be a violation, then you're also not likely to do anything about it. Okay? So you have to know which things that you think are good behaviors, bad behaviors, and the 10 wholesome, unwholesome list are very good, very helpful in that regard. So the fourth one then is the power of the action as an antidote, or sometimes it's called the power of the antidote. And so this is the action that we are taking as a part of this. This is actually the practice itself of Vajrasattva that we do. And so the power involves accomplishing as many positive actions as we can, particularly prostrations to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, rejoicing the merit of others, dedicating your sources of good, a future good to enlightenment, cultivating bodhicitta of intention and application, staying in the essence of the unaltered natural state. So uh, those are some guidelines on things that how we need to incorporate the antidote as a part of that. So it's doing the practice, but it is also living the practice, living that life and applying that thing in day-to-day -day kinds of activities. At the bottom of the page there, uh, he quotes from Drakpo, Drakpo Rinpoche, even if you have committed negative actions as colossal as Mount Meru itself, they are purified in one instant of seeing that nature. So our own Buddha nature, when we see our own Buddha nature, uh, then that actually helps purify the process. So that says to me that I need to be careful about doing my practice all the time, throughout the day. If something comes up, if I do something wrong, I don't need to wait until tomorrow when I do my Vajrasattva practice. I can do something right now to address that. And then he continues on, there is indeed no deeper way to cleanse oneself of past misdeeds than to meditate on bodhicitta 
and to maintain the flow of the unaltered natural state, uh, unaltered state of mind. And so that's an important part. Bodhicitta, intention, action, and the ultimate bodhicitta. And so we keep those things in mind as we go through our day. That then can help facilitate that process. So we are a Buddha at all times. We act as if we are a Buddha. It may be a role play, but it's also actual action part of bodhicitta. And then the third part of this section is the actual meditation on Vajrasattva. So this is a little bit longer. This is going through the de details of the actual practice here. Unfortunately, he refers to a specific sadhana practice over and over again, but we don't have the actual sadhana included here. So there are a wide variety of those that are available that you can use for that purpose. For the visualization, see yourself in ordinary form. So you are in ordinary form. Above your head, visualize a white lotus with a thousand petals and a disk of a full moon. So we've got the lotus, white lotus, and then a disk, which would be flat on top of it, becomes the seat. So we're visualizing that up above our head, the crown of our head there. And then it's like a completely full moon. So that moon disk is a round disk, a completely round disk. And then upon that, visualize a brilliant white syllable hum. Now, hum would be the Sanskrit, and the Tibetans tend to pronounce it as hum, H-U-N-G. And if you look at page 272, a few pages over, you see the actual syllable there and, and the different parts of that, the components of that, which we'll come back to when we get to that. But if you're not familiar with that, that's what that syllable looks like. So it's standing up above that disc, the round disc. We have the lotus, the disc, and then the home syllable standing up there. And then he continues on in the next paragraph, the Hong is transformed into your glorious root teacher, who in essence is the nature of all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future in one. He appears in the form of the Sambhokakaya Buddha. So that means that he's apparent, but a little transparent, is not uh, a solid person like looking at me. But when you look at Vajrasattva, He's translucent. You can see through him, like looking at a rainbow, for example. He appears in the form of the Sambhokakaya Buddha, so that also means that he's got uh, the dress. It's kind of like royalty dress of India that they would be wearing as a part of that. And he is white in color, so his skin is white and is radiant. He has one face and two arms. So simple form. With his right hand, he holds before his heart a five-pronged vajra. So he holds one of these. It's in his right hand at his heart. So he's holding it there at his chest. Uh, the vajra awareness and emptiness. So one end is awareness. The other end is emptiness, or other symbols that sometimes are used for that. With his left, he rests the bell of appearance and emptiness on his left hip. So he has the bell and it's turned over upside down and he's holding that in the left hand at his hip as a part of this. And then his legs are crossed in the Vajra posture and he's adorned with the ornaments of Sambhokakaya. So I was mentioning the five silken garments, the eight jewels and so forth. So he's got his earrings and his necklaces and armbands and, and bracelets and anklets and so forth. So then he gives the list, the five silken garments, the headband, the upper garment, a long scarf, a belt, and a lower garment. The eight jewels, a crown, earrings, short necklace, armlets, two, two long necklaces, one longer than the other, a bracelet on each wrist, a ring in each hand, an anklet on each foot. So then Vajrasattva is seated above your head, as we were talking about, 
facing the same direction as you. So I'm in this direction facing this way, so Vajrasattva is up here also facing that same way. And it would be whatever way you happen to be facing. So then he embraces in inseparable union his consort, Vajratopa. So in this version, he and his consort are together in union. And if you go back to the first page of this section, page uh, 262, you have a picture that you can look at. And you see Vajrasattva there with his consort sitting in union. And it's got the lotus, it's got the, the moon disk, the white disk that he's seated upon. And then the two of them together, the various ornaments and so forth as a part of that. So Vajratopa is his consort, and actually in different texts sometimes you'll find different names for the consort, and so that may vary a little bit from one to the other. And she's also white, and then their bodies are empty appearance. So that's what I was referring to previously. This is a term that refers to this translucent quality. So vividly present, but without any substance of their own, like reflections of the moon in water, or forms reflected in a mirror, or I would add more like a rainbow, because it's more transparent. And then this visualization provides the power of support. So the visualization is one of the four powers as a part of that. It appears, it's very clear and distinct, and yet it's got this empty quality to it. There's, there's not one atom, he says, of solid, excuse me, of solid substance. No flesh, no blood, no internal organs or things like that. It's like a rainbow or an immaculate crystal vase. Some of the statues these days are actually being made out of uh, a crystal-like form. I think usually they're made out of plastic, but they're transparent. And actually that is more accurate in terms of the way we're told to visualize them than like something made out of brass or, or copper and so forth. As it is imbued with wisdom, Lord Vajrasattva is identical in nature with your own compassionate root teacher, and his mind reaches out to you and to all beings with great love. So as we visualize him, he's just radiating a sense of love out there to all beings. Then we come to the power of regret. So here, uh, in his presence, Call to mind all the negative actions that you've thought about and accumulated until now in one samsaric existence after another since time without beginning. And he gives a list here of examples of that, so you can look through that, won't go through all of those, but you get the idea that different things that you have done in the past, maybe you deliberately killed an insect or you uh, did some other thing, you uh, did something mean to a, a friend that you n regretted having done, and so forth. So then he says after the list there, feel that you are confessing them in Vajrasattva's presence with shame, fear, and remorse. You can be sure that during all the infinite lives of samsara you have done many negative actions that you cannot even remember. So confess them all. And then he gives, this would be a quote from Sadhana, for example, I am keeping nothing secret. I am hiding nothing. I confess openly and ask for forgiveness. I have compassion on me. Right away at this very moment and in this very life, cleanse and purify me of all my negative actions and obscurations so that not a single one remains. So we're mess making the request of Vajrasattva to purify us. And then the power of resolve, and this may be in the text part as well. Until now I have accumulated those harmful negative actions because of my ignorance and confusion. But now, Thanks to the compassion of my kind teacher, I know what is beneficial and what is harmful, and I will never commit them again, even if it costs me my life. So making this very strong commitment there, uh, our own life as a part of that. So that's the power of resolve. We're making that commitment not to make those, do those kinds of actions again. And then we recite from the text. Again, we don't have this text. He gives the, a section to recite as a part of that. 
And then on the top of 269 below the quote, then in the heart of Vajrasattva, who is indivisibly united with his consort, visualize a lunar disk no bigger than a flattened mustard seed. Okay, so this is inside of Vajrasattva himself, who is up above us, and there's this real tiny flat lunar disk, and on it is a white hole. And then, as if it had been drawn by a single hair, there is this white hung syllable. Okay, remember we did a white hung syllable in our heart, and then that manifested into Vajrasattva. So now there's another one in his heart, so he's small, and so the, the disc inside of him is very tiny. And then it, um, as if drawn by a single hair. And then we recite the hundred syllable mantra. Now normally the mantra then would be standing upright in the syllables circling around the outside edge of, or the just above the edge of the disc. And so it would be turning around and then we could actually, if we read one syllable at a time, we would be actually reading the entire mantra one circulation around that. And so we visualize the syllables arranged around the home in a circle. And then, and um, so I'm going to take a short break there just uh, because he doesn't include the hundred syllable mantra here. So if you're not familiar with it, I wanted to um, recite that for you. And you can find this is easily available in uh, lots of different places, and uh, there are different uh, commentaries that explain the meaning of the mantra and so forth. But it goes Om Benza Sato Samaya Manupalaya Benza Sato Tenopa Tishta Drido Mebawa Sutokayo Mebawa Supokayo Mebawa Anu Rakto Mebawa Sarva Sidi Me Prayata Sarva Karma Sutsa Me Titum Triya Kuru Hong Ha 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 Ho Bhagavam Sarva Tata Kata Benza Mame Munsan Benze Bawa Mahasamaya Sato A. So that's the, the full hundred syllable mantra. And most people will memorize that by doing that over and over and over again. There's a recorded version on our website under resources, and, and there's a sung version with tune, which makes it a little bit easier to memorize. And then there's the way that I did it there. And so you can just play that, and you can play it over and over and over again and help you to memorize that and how to do that recitation, which comes in helpful uh, when you're doing the actual recitation. Um, so he says then to recite the hundred syllables as a prayer, imagining that a nectar com of compassion and wisdom drips down from each of the syllables. So the syllables are going around up here, and from each syllable drops down a little nectar, and that goes uh, down through him like water dripping down from ice, and then pouring down through the body of Vajrasattva, the nectar emerges from the point of union of the deity and consort Vajatopa, and then passing through the crown of your head, it flows into you. And then he adds all, also into all other sentient beings. That's usually not, at least in the the various practices that I have seen, uh, the sadhanas that I have seen, that's uh, an unusual thing to actually visualize it going out to all, but that's a nice way, uh, a nice addition actually uh, to the comment about that. So we're visualizing it coming from Vajrasattva, it's coming down through him and his consort into our head, and it's going down and it's literally washing out all of those obscurations from us. So they stream out, the physical illnesses are flushed out, negative forces are expelled, all this is carried away by the irresistible flood of nectar and pours out your body as a black shower through the lower orifices, through the soles of your feet, and through all the pores of your skin. So it's coming down, coming down as a pure white substance, and that white substance is washing out all of those negativities which are viewed as being a thick black substance. So then below that, the earth actually is said to open up. 
and in the depths of the pyramid's death, the personification of your past actions, surrounded by all male and female beings to who you owe karmic debts, and all those who seek to avenge themselves on your flesh. While you recite the hundred syllable mantra, visualize all those impurities pouring down into their open mouths and into the hands and arms they raise expectantly toward you. And then if you can, visualize the whole process simultaneously. Otherwise, you can alternate. So it's best if you can just, and after you've done this a little while, it's pretty easy to visualize the whole thing simultaneously. But in the beginning, it's okay to just do parts of it at a time as you go through the whole thing. And then he gives some additional advice while we're reciting. As you recite, sometimes concentrate on the body of Vajrasattva, his face, hands, and so on. Sometimes on his ornaments and clothing. Sometimes on the flow of nectar, purifying illnesses, negative forces, evil actions, and obscurations. And sometimes on your regret for what you have done, and you resolve never to repeat it. So this is, this is the alternate, is going through and breaking it up into pieces and doing it in that way. Otherwise, just seeing the whole thing all occurring at once. Then at the end, imagine that death and all others below the earth, they're down there in that open space that opened up there, are appeased and satisfied. Various past scores have been settled, deaths have been repaid, vengeance has been appeased, and you are cleansed of all past negative actions and obscurations. And then the birth, the earth closes again. So imagine your body has now become transparent inside and out, a body of light. And so it's like our skin is transparent, and then inside we poured all this milk. <laughs> and so it's, it's white, but it is still a little bit translucent, I would say. So to be white and, he says transparent, but um, if it was transparent, you couldn't see the white. So uh, it would be more like a translucent kind of color. But a body of light was just radiating this white light outward. And he goes through and talks a little bit about it in terms of channels and, and the chakras and so forth. There's a part of that. Uh, people who are just learning this often don't know much about that, so I'm going to pass by that for now, but you can read through that paragraph. And then he says that the nectar completely fills our entire body, rimming with white nectar. You are like a crystal vase filled with milk. Okay? And then think that you are receiving the four empowerments. And he talks, mentions what those are. The first one is the vase empowerment, then the secret empowerment, the wisdom empowerment, and the precious word empowerment. And so those empower us to, to do different things. Um, usually when we do uh, receive empowerments, we first receive a purification process, much like Vajrasattva. In fact, we may actually recite the 100-syllable mantra as a part of that. And then having done that, we also then begin the vase empowerment. So the vase empowerment is usually done with a vase, the top part here put in, that's actually Vajrasattva and, and Vajatopa there, and done that, and so pour a little water in your hand, and you take that, and then uh, put it in your mouth, and wipe any residue over the crown of your head, and then you either spit it out, or you uh, swallow it, or in some cases, you wipe it on some, some cloth. Uh, different llamas have it done different ways. Um, depending on the facility you're in, the number of people, and, and things like that. So uh, we do the vase empowerment. It is a, is a purification. It uh, purifies our body uh, and prepares us then for the rest of the teachings, not going through all the details, but then the secret one uh, purifies our speech. And then the third one, the wisdom empowerment, purifies our mind. And then the precious word empowerment purifies our other obscurations. So it goes through as a series of empowerments, giving us the, the power to do certain aspects of the practice. Uh, what we're empowered to do varies a little bit. 
uh, depending on the lineage and in some cases the specific empowerment being done. Uh, but a common way is that the, the first one empowers you to do the generation stage practice. The second one does, empowers you to do uh, the uh, completion. No, wait. Uh, make sure I get this in the right order here. Um, base empowerment. The second one would be the um, secret empowerment. And usually, um, that one uh, empowers you to recite the mantra, and then the wisdom empowerment is the dissolution into emptiness, and then the word empowerment is the embodiment of that um, being the deity. But they vary, and different ones will have different forms of empowerment as a part of that. So then he goes on to say, we're purified of the four uh, kinds of obscurations, karmic obscurations, obscurations of negative emotions, conceptual obscurations, and obscurations of habitual tendencies. And then the four joys arise. Um, the joy, supreme joy, extraordinary joy, and innate joy. Um, those are usually part of the completion stage practice. So we learn about those and how those arise. And then the four kayas are established, nirmanakaya, the kind of physical manifestation of a Buddha, the Sambhokakaya, uh, which is the deity form of a Buddha, basically, and Dharmakaya, which is literally truth body, but is the, the wisdom aspect, and then Swabhavakakaya, which embellishes all of those together in, in one. And then we have a prayer in this case. He just gives the beginning and the end of that. But the, again, the prayers would be in the sadhana practice that you are doing. Then he says, to imagine Vajrasattva grants your prayer with these words or something similar to this. Fortunate one, all your negative actions, obscurations, violations, and breaches are purified. So now he, he says, yes, we have done that. You're all purified that. Then, top of page 271, he melts into light, dissolves into you, so that you yourself are now transformed into Vajrasattva. Then visualize in his heart this moon disk that we saw before, and then in the center is the blue hung, so it's a different color here, and then uh, in front of him is a white syllable om, and to his left is a vajra that is yellow, and then behind is a saw in red, and on the right is a uh, twa in green. And so you can see how those are depicted here, both in terms of the, the syllables in Tibetan and in an English language uh, version of those. So it starts at the bottom with om, in this case, and then goes to the vajra, the sa, the twa, and the hong. And as you recite that, it's Om Vajra Sattva Hung, or Om Vajra Sato Hung, as Tibetans are likely to say. Uh, and so it's a short mantra. That's a short version of the Vajra Sattva mantra. And so it can be done both, or in some practices, uh, it can be done either. In some practices, you do both. So you do the hundred syllable a few times, and maybe you do it three times, for example, and then you do the long one, um, maybe 28 times or something like that. And as you're doing that, these light rays emanate out, and there are offerings to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and then we receive blessings as a part of that, and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to skip over to the about middle, a little above the middle of page 272, so you can read about the detailed descriptions. They, they tend to be uh, a much more advanced level of descriptions than the way we initially used this practice, so I'm not going into those at that level for that reason. So recite the mantra as many times as you can. To conclude the, conclude the session, visualize that the whole universe with which you have been perceiving as a Buddha field of manifest joy dissolves into Vajrasattva, uh, five families, and then melt into light and dissolve into you, then you melt into light and then dissolve into, and he has he goes through the Om Vajrasattva, 
as a part of that. But typically what it's done is if you look at the Hong syllable as it's been broken into pieces here, when we do it, we're dissolving the outside in. So we dissolve Vajrasattva and any other beings that are considered to be in appearance. And he mentioned the five Buddha families. And so those dissolve into us. We become Vajrasattva. We dissolve from the bottom up and the top down into the heart with the lotus and the disc and the syllable. And then the lotus and disc dissolve into the syllable. And then it goes from the bottom up. So with the shabku and then the ah and then the ha the two parts of the ha, and then the crescent, the bindu, and the nada into emptiness, okay? And so that's the way that we dissolve that into that point. And then we just remain relaxed. It says here, remain relaxed in that state for a while. So it's basically a meditation uh, in the state of emptiness. Uh, and then when thoughts start to arise, See clearly the whole universe and bring and the beings it contains as the Buddha field of Vajrasattva and then dedicate the merit. So that's a typical way that it is practiced. Like I said, there are different sadhanas, and so they will vary a little bit in terms of the actual text and some of the details involved in that. But that's the basic practice. Um, and so he says that it's imperative as a part of this not to let your mind be distracted from concentration on the practice. So anytime you're doing any practice, um, including this one, don't get distracted. Keep focused. Keep your attention on what you are actually doing there. Be attentive. Uh, then he goes into a fairly long section here that I'm not going to talk about addressing uh, the role of different lamas in doing ceremonies in villages and, and things like that. At the bottom of 275, last paragraph there, he says, take the love and compassion of bodhicitta as your basis from the very start. Never let your wish to help, uh, never give up your wish to help others. Make a sincere effort to put everything you know about the generation and perfection phases, uh, sometimes called completion phases, phases uh, into practice to the very best of your ability. Um, again, usually that aspect is taught uh, later on, but we've received the the aspect of bodhicitta, and so embodying bodhicitta at all times is a very important aspect of not only our practice, but also living our lives. Very important. At the bottom of the second paragraph, the Tantra of Immaculate Confession says, the hundred syllable mantra is the quintessence of the mind of all the Sugatas, the Buddhas. It purifies all violations, all breaches, all conceptual obscurations. That's pretty powerful. It is the supreme confession, and to recite it 108 times without interruptions Pre repairs all violations and breaches and will save one from tumbling into the three lower realms. So that's something you might think about doing. You know, set aside some time and, and recite that. That's one mala. It's a little long because it is the full hundred syllables, but you do that. And if you don't get distracted in the process of doing that, that is said to purify all of those previous negative actions that, that we have done. Or an alternative to that is doing it 21 times, which is in this uh, next full paragraph, third line. Daily repetition of a hundred syllable mantra 21 times every day constitutes what is called the blessing of downfalls. It will prevent the effects of those downfalls from developing or increasing. So if we violate, now downfalls is a term that's used primarily in the Vinaya for monks and nuns. And so typically it doesn't apply to lay practitioners, but it would be the equivalent of violate one, violating one of the vows that you have made, one of the samayas that you committed to, um, and that kind of thing, or violating one of the, the ten 
and wrong, wrongful actions, committing one of those, um, not doing one of the ten wholesome actions, and those kind of things. So it will prevent those downfalls from developing or increasing. 100,000 recitations will completely purify all your downfalls. So. One of the things that I wanted to mention here, because it's talking about 100,000, and we haven't talked about very much, but we mentioned it, I believe, previously in the text, is that traditionally we do repetitions of each of these different practices. And so there's four or five, depending on how it's articulated. But uh, in this case, he breaks out bodhicitta as a separate one. So we have refuge, we have bodhicitta, and then we have Vajrasattva. Next will be the mandala offering, and then Guru Yoga. So five different actions that we do. And the tradition is that you do each of those 100,000 times, okay? So that's a total of 500,000. That takes quite a while, especially for lay practitioners to do that. Uh, but it typically, as I understand it, is done during a three-year retreat at the end of the, the basic practice, more or less equivalent to, to high school and the, the monasteries. And so at the end of that time, they may, not all of them do, go into a three-year retreat. It's actually three years, three months, and three days. Or maybe three months, or three years, three months, three weeks, three days. I'm not sure if the weeks are in there or not, sorry. Um, and, but it's a long period of time. And so they fin spend the first part of that completing these Nundo repetitions, uh, which you know vary a little bit, but typically take around six months. But for us, if we don't have the time to do that many repetitions immediately, it's going to take quite a bit longer to do those things. So it's a, it's a significant commitment to do those. But I also would like to add that not all lamas require you to do those for 100,000 repetitions. There's actually three ways in the teachings that those are said to be done. One of them is by number, which would be the 100,000 in most cases. A second one is by time. And so one of my teachers, Anto Rinpoche, said to do it for one year. Just do it for a year. And if you recall the teachings from Jigme Lodo Rinpoche, he said to do this for 100 days, he had the 100-day Nindra practice. And so that's another version of time. And then the third version is by signs. And signs are that you uh, reach a point and your teacher agrees with you that you have mastered those. And so you do one, like you do refuge, uh, and you keep doing it, and then maybe you meet once a month or something like that, you talk about what you're doing, and, and so forth, and the Lama either says, okay, that's enough of that, or uh, and you can go on to the next one, or no, go ahead, continue doing some more. In fact, I have heard of examples of Lamas saying, after you completed all 500,000, no, do it again. <laughs> you weren't serious enough about how you did that. So it's variable. The other thing that I like to add to this is another way of looking at it in terms of time is that you never complete Nundro. Okay? You keep doing refuge. You do refuge every day as a part of your practice. You never complete bodhicitta. That's a lifelong commitment to stay in, in continue that as a practice. You never complete purification. We always need purification. So we do that, whether you do the long one or the short one, um, each day. We should do it each day. And then when we, we'll get to the, the mandala, we always make offerings. Virtually all practices involve making offerings of some kind or other. And then guru yoga is the root of all of the deity practices. And so we do, the, we do them all the time. It's not that we so-called complete Nundra, we don't. We never complete it. We continue that for the rest of our life and maybe future lives as well. So anyway, wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about that as well. Continuing then in the middle of page 277, uh, bottom of the paragraph just below the indented quote, uh, he says that we make meditation and recitation of Vajrasattva our daily practice, or at least recite the mantra 21 times a day without fail. Now, you can just, resort, uh, can just recite the short mantra, Om Vajrasattva, uh, 
And so that's a little bit shorter way to do it, but you do, and I've heard it two ways, either four times as many or six times as many as the long one. But in either case, it's still shorter than 21 times of the long one, okay? So that's an alternative way of doing that. So you might keep that in mind. Uh, and then the samayas, the vows that we have as a part of that, paying attention to those. Uh, there's something here he calls violation through contact. Uh, so in talking about samayas, which are our commitments that we do in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, when we do, we take an empowerment and so forth, that uh, what he calls violation through contact, we become contaminated through contact. Um, I don't know how we would ever not become contaminated by contact in the context of the kind of lives that we live, but we don't typically make that kind of a commitment either. So uh, continuing on page 278, then below the quote at the top, there is not a single teacher, even if he is a great lama or siddha, who has a who can escape this sort of contamination by Samaya violations. And then he goes through and gives a number of different stories. And so then at the top of page 279, uh, just below the quote there, he says, violations of uh, tantric Samayas are easy to repair since they can be purified by confession. In the Shravakas tradition, the monastic tradition, to commit one complete root downfall is like smashing an earthenware pot. There is simply no way to repair it. But then we go on to the Bodhisattva tradition and the vows there to break the Bodhisattva vows is more like breaking an object made of precious metal. So it can be repaired by a skillful goldsmith. Likewise, a broken vow can be purified with the help of a spiritual friend. As for the tantric vows, committing downfalls is slightly denting something made of precious metal, and so you can purify it yourself simply by confessing it, and then using the support of the deity, the mantra, and concentration. So if confessed immediately, it's easy. The longer you wait, however, the more powerful the fault grows. So we want to be sure that we're doing these things every day. Think back about whatever faults you have committed every day so that you can recite this and purify every day. It makes it easier. And then more difficult confession over time, the more difficult it becomes. If it goes more than three years, the downfall is said to be beyond confession. Can't do it. Of course, there are things that say, like Vajrasattva, if we do the Vajrasattva, you can purify anything in from be since beginningless time. So there are still ways to, to do that. But it's best if you can make Vajrasattva, at least re re visualization, reciting the mantra as a part of that, and then build the four powers into that process of thinking about that, confessing, and committing not to do that again as a part of your regular daily practice. And then the last paragraph at the bottom of the page, he says, Vajrasattva embodies the hundred deities in one. He is called Vajrasattva, the single deity of the great secret. Uh, the, the peaceful and wrathful deities consider him as being one in essence with your own root teacher. This is the practice of Guru Yoga in the manner of which the jewel, which includes all. And so thinking of Vajrasattva, so sometimes in the way the lineage is broken down in the Nyingma tradition in particular, you have Samatabhadra, Samatabhadri, as depicted here in the Tonka painting, and then you would have Vajrasattva, and then you would have the five Buddha families, and then you would have the hundred wrathful and peaceful deities, as in the Tonka painting here. And so that's one of the ways that it is depicted, which is what he appears to be referring to as he gives these descriptions. So that concludes the Vajrasattva practice, so we'll take a little break and, and talk about it here. Did that go? Yeah.